Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to call to order this hearing of the Health Finance and Policy Committee. Today is the auspicious Tuesday 22222. Two, two, two. How about that? February 22nd, 2022. So um, welcome, everyone. I understand that uh, the snow might be having some impact on some people's internet. So uh, we may have a few members struggling with that, um, and we understand this is not a perfect system by any means if, if that is happening to you. So uh, the first order of business is to take the attendance, and Ms. Niedernhofer. Chair Liebling. Present. Vice Chair Hewitt. Present. Leach Schumacher. Schumacher, present. Representative Ackland. Ackland present. Representative Backer. Backer present. Representative Bonner. Representative Bonner. Representative Bierman. Present. Representative Bold Bolden. Bolden present. Representative Damoth. Damoth present. Representative Freiburg. Present. Representative Grunhagen. Present. Representative Keel. Representative Keel. Representative Morrison. Morrison present. Representative Munson. Munson present. Representative Pryor. Present. Representative Kwan. Representative Kwan. Present. Representative Ryer. Present. Representative Schultz. Present. Representative Wolgamot. Representative Wolgamot. A quorum is present. All right. Thank you, Ms. Niedernhofer. And as, of course, as members come in who've been delayed, we will, of course, mark them present. So um, the next order of business is to approve the minutes from yesterday, February 21st. Representative Quam. I so move, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative Quam. Uh, is there any discussion to the minutes? Seeing none, if, if members would please unmute for a voice vote. All those in favor of approval of the minutes, please say aye. 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 I opposed. The motion prevails and the minutes are approved. Thank you, Representative Quam. Okay, so today we are focusing on um, exceptions to the bed moratorium. And we're going to start the hearing today with a brief presentation from Mr. Gildemeister of the Department of Health to just uh, set the playing field here for us on the process and uh, talk about some of the issues involved. And then we will hear three bills that are uh, requesting exceptions. And those bills, just so members are aware, all of them, those will be laid over for possible inclusion in the finance bill. So Mr. Gildemeister, thank you for being here today and welcome, please go ahead. Um, Madam Chair, I am apologizing. I was on the phone and you couldn't hear me, but um, I am now uh, assuming that you can hear me. Yes, we can. Are you having internet problems too? Sorry for the technical uh and difficulties, Madam Chair. Uh, for the record, my name is Stefan Gildemeister. I am the state health economist and I direct the health economics program. I'm also um, snowed in in Cass County, so uh, my my bandwidth isn't great. And, and so the legislative team kindly is, is, is running the slideshow. Um, I heard your introduction that you're looking for a, a brief presentation. That's what I'm queued up to do. Uh, I'll provide a little bit of information on the background about the uh, hospital bed moratorium. I'll talk about some current activities and, and um, uh, summarize a few findings that we, that we took away from some recent public interest reviews 
public in interest reviews. Next slide, please. So to begin, um, the hospital bed moratorium, as the name suggests, prohibits the establishment uh, of new hospital licenses in Minnesota and the expansion of existing hospital license beds in the state. It, it also um, established a process um, for reviewing uh, proposals for exception to the moratorium, such as you are conducting today. Uh, uh, process for conducting reviews when there are multiple parties interested in submitting a proposal uh, on a site or a type of facility and uh, requires a, a set of activities for MDH to conduct um, in monitoring uh, implementation of, of exceptions. Next slide, please. Um, the hospital bed moratorium was um, adopted in Minnesota in 1984 uh, following um, legislative dissatisfaction with the certificate of need process. There was a concern that um, uh, excessive hospital bed capacity uh, existed in the state and, and cost associated with expanding that capacity further and, and using up uh, or, or creating unnecessary uh, hospital admissions uh, were contributing to, to the trends in healthcare spending. So the moratorium was intended to uh, remedy this more effectively. By 2004, the legislature added to the process the public interest review um, um, uh, step, which really is intended to provide the legislature with additional and independent uh, information to guide your decision. Uh, in 2006, um, there, uh, the legislature added a component on, on evaluating um, multiple competing proposals. And then most recently, um, uh, you added timelines for completing of uh, public interest reviews um, because uh, there, there were challenges with, with these materializing in time for review by um, uh, legislative session. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned, the public interest review component is a really important aspect of the hospital bed moratorium. It requires uh, proposals. It's a required step uh, in, in, in the process and requires the establishment of proposals for exception to the law. Uh, as I as I noted, the interest reviews, public interest reviews, are intended to provide unbiased and empirical information to the legislative process. Under this uh, um, component, uh, MDH considers a number of relevant factors uh, and makes a recommendation whether a proposal is in the public interest. We tend to look at roughly five factors, whether including whether the um, beds are needed for timely access to, to health care, um, what the financial impact is on existing facilities, particularly those with emergency room de um, departments, um, what the practices are for providing um, care to low-income and non-paying clients, uh, and, and to what extent a new proposal has the potential to affect um, uh, workforce retention at other facilities. Um, and then we, we're also uh, required to seek um, perspectives of uh, affected entities uh, on, on these uh, uh, on, the, on proposals before the legislature. So while MDH considers uh, these proposals and makes recommendations, I want to um, highlight that it's really the legislature who retains the decision to grant an exception to the moratorium. Next slide, please. So the public interest review process um, uh, is a roughly a 190 day process. Um, hospital or hospital operator submits a proposal. Um, the, the state has about uh, a month to review it and formulate a number of additional uh, requests for information, questions, clarification, additional data. Um, the the uh, submitter has 14 days to respond to that proposal. Then, we have about a 150-day uh, uh, time to conduct the review and submit uh, uh, the 
the, our finding to the legislature. And during that time, about every 30 days, we provide the legislature with an update um, of, of our process. And when we have multiple uh, proposals before us, um, we tend to, they, they are required to be organized in the order they are received. So um, um, they are, while we're walking and chewing and are looking for efficiencies, um, um, they are not able to be happening at the same time. And I also wanted to point out here, the legislative timeline assumes these proposals would be available by August 1st of a given year for consideration by the legislature the next year. Um, that's not been that's not been the case, and I'll, I'll document that maybe in a second as well. Um, next step, uh, I'm sorry. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, the public interest review process is a really public process with all the material living online, um, including the proposal and the questions we've asked and the data that are submitted. And, and um, interested uh, individuals may, may um, look on this site for the most updated information uh, at any time. Uh, next slide, please. Since uh, 2004, when the public interest review requirement was passed, MDH has conducted about uh, has conducted nine reviews for 13 exceptions that the legislature passed, and they fall into a number of buckets here. Um, but uh, over the duration of the hospital moratorium, uh, the legislature has adopted about 30 exceptions to date. Next slide, please. And one more. Thank you. Um, this is, so last uh, legislative session, um, the legislature passed two exceptions to the hospital bed moratorium, one for Regents Hospital and one for prayer care, both to add beds uh, to the existent uh, bed license. Since then, MDH uh, has received uh, three additional proposals from North Shore Health, Fairview and Acadia, and Children's Minnesota. In the interest of time, I'll not go into the details of these proposals uh, because I know your um, your authors um, will look to describe those uh, uh, proposals on their own. So next slide, please. And one more. Thank you. Um, I, I wanted to take maybe two moments and talk about what we've learned from um, the public interest review broadly and then more narrowly with regard to the prairie care uh, in public interest review concerning um, inpatient bed for children and youth. Um, just uh, as a reminder, you've, many of you have heard that uh, there is always a tension involved with the public interest review as it concerns business needs and broader access to services and that's sort of built into uh, the moratorium and the public inter interest review and, and creates some challenges for the legislature's uh, decision making. Also related, uh, sort of by definition, the public interest review is limited in scope. We tend to look at an, indiv an individual proposal that is site specific, generally one, a one-off approach, rather than more broadly asking ourselves how a proposal contributes to um, access to needed and timely healthcare services uh, in general. The, the moratorium has, has, as you know, baked in um, market share uh, uh, that existed before the moratorium by permitting entities with um, uh, uh, licensed beds that are not in use to bank them. So that means entities that want to expand and have banked licensed beds can go forward without a public interest review. That's not the case for, for hospitals or hospital systems like health partners and regions when they um, um, sought an exception for additional for additional beds. So the one related challenge is effectively the legislature um, um, doesn't in the process doesn't recognize there's an economic value associated with um, um, permitting with, with a license spend and 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 um, that I think creates some challenges. There are data challenges too in that um, the the public interest review process lacks data on transfer requests, ED boarding, 
uh, financial data is limited at times. And then, as I indicated um, politely, I think um, the timeline doesn't always work out for um, submitters, uh, which means that uh, proposals arrive outside of the uh, uh, timeline that makes it able to deliver public interest reviews and the information the legislature seeks in time for session. So instead of having that information currently available for the three proposals, we're just beginning that work. And, and I know that's dissatisfying to everyone. Uh, next slide, please. And one more. Uh, and maybe one more forward. Thank you. Um, with regard to, to children and youth mental health services, um, please one, one slide back. Uh, the, that the Prairie Care proposal um, um, sought to address to some extent with its, with its proposal last session. Um, there are the following challenges uh, for the review and more broadly for addressing um, bottlenecks as they, as they uh, present themselves to patients and, and families and, and also the system overall. I think the first and most important one perhaps is that collectively we have an incomplete understanding of the need for services and, and um, the extent to which uh, that affects care capacity bottlenecks in, in, the in the state, the factors that really affect these bottlenecks. For example, um, we don't have really good data to help us understand uh, the number of children who have mental health, health needs and the kind of services that are recommended for those children. We don't generally have a good understanding of access to upstream uh, services and outpatient care and the extent to which patients are able to get a timely diagnosis. Of course, there are a lot of cultural issues um, related to, to, to um, mental illness as well. And, and we also don't have data or a good understanding about the extent to which uh, labor force challenges and payment rates ultimately are responsible for the barriers affecting access to healthcare services for, for these needy children and youth. Um, with regard to specialty hospitals, uh, which these psychiatric facilities uh, are, we, we're also uh, typically not seeing data on uh, utilization and finances on an annual basis as we do for other hospitals because um, that requirement doesn't exist for, uh, for, for specialty facilities. So that means we don't really have good sidelines on the volume of services, the change over time, and, and the bottlenecks that we're experiencing. Um, as part of our review, we um, acknowledge that though the Prairie Care proposal was in the public interest, we felt it was not single-handedly able to resolve the challenges that we've seen uh, um, with regard to inpatient mental health beds. And I'll um, maybe say something really quickly uh, in, in conclusion, uh, rather than walking through the data slides that are, are coming, but I um, recommend maybe members to take a look at them when, when you have a moment. Uh, essentially, for our analysis of the prayer care proposal, we identified that um, there are children who are hospitalized in facilities that don't have pediatric mental health beds. And, and that's some, sort of one indication that kids can't get a bed when they need them. And that's about 800 times per year um, in Minnesota across the state. We've also documented and, 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 and um, demonstrated that families um, routinely travel 40 miles or farther for inpatient care about 480 times uh, over uh, the period of 2019 and 2020. So that's um, that's that's an indication of the, the the weaknesses of the system that children can't get care for for really acute needs unless they and their family travel far. Um, We've also documented that children are children are temporarily boarded in emergency rooms at really um, dissatisfying high levels, uh, and 900 times uh, over two year period. And and thinking about prairie care and the addition of beds um, that that they were approved for, um, it will not cover 
the number of times when Prairie Care had to decline requests for transfer from, from other emergency room departments uh, seeking a bed for children in their care. And, and um, over, I think, a year and a half period covered by data that Prairie Care submitted, there were about um, 1,200 times when that when that happened. So these are a lot of indications that the system is not working well, but but it, they are um, they are compounded by the challenge of not knowing whether um, this is really an indication that we need more beds or whether it's an indication an indication that upstream factors or workforce factors single handedly account for for these challenges. We know the Hospital Association has collected data to demonstrate and illustrate the extent to which um, children are in beds um, when they could be going to other facilities with step-down care. Um, and those kind of data are useful, um, uh, but, but we see such data just not routinely enough. And, and there's a little follow-up to, to understanding these um, uh, these challenges. Uh, and, and I'll stop here, um, Madam Chair, and to see if you have questions for me. Well, thank you so much, Mr. Gildemeister. That is really, really helpful. And uh, the one question that I have before I go to uh, Representative Bierman is uh, we're going to be hearing the three bills today, and you've indicated that they've all applied for public interest review, but none of them with the statutory timeline. And I just wonder if you can give us an update on how far along you might be in your um, analysis of each of those proposals, and if you have, if you can, and any uh, any timeline that you can give us when we might expect to hear uh, to get a report or even a preliminary report on any of the three proposals. I'm happy to, Madam Chair. Um, the North Shore proposal um, is the one that uh, came first in line. And um, we anticipate to, um, we, I think, just issued a public register notice to request information, uh, to request feed for feedback from other entities on that proposal. So that work is beginning um, and is perhaps the most uh, farthest along. Um, the Fairview proposal, um, we've issued questions to Fairview and have received um, responses to those questions. So those reviews will start, that, that re review is in the beginning phases as well. And I think we'll um, um, schedule a hearing on, on, on that proposal because it's so complex and, and um, is establishing a new facility. Um, the children's uh, uh, hospital proposal is the last in line, so to speak. And we have not um, finalized our initial review yet. Uh, and, and sort of can't speak to whether there are additional questions. Um, I, I think what I can commit to, again, as I said earlier, is that we have 150 days to conduct the review, and um, we, t we take that timeline seriously so that we can um, treat both the applicant with fairness and deliver the reviews with the rigor that you and, and the applicants expect. So that's, that's a, a, a process that we want to give its due diligence to. Um, so effectively, I think that time would would um, uh, be sometime in July to have the public interest reviews completed. I anticipate we probably can do at least a North Shore review much before then, before that date. But um, I can't quite give you a date yet because I, just too many. Uh, steps need to play out in a certain way for that to materialize. I should also say, this is not an excuse, but um, our staff contribute to the uh, COVID response. So to the extent that this, this will become a peaceful and sustained peaceful time, we can focus on this work. If that's not the case, um, uh, many of us will be drawn into uh, another public health response. All right. Thank you so much. So a couple members have hands up and just if we could just do a couple of quick questions, Mr. Gildemeister, and then we'll let you go and we'll move on to our bills. Uh, Representative Bierman. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you, Director Gildemeister, for being with us, even in the trying circumstances without all of your tools here today. We appreciate it. Uh, first question is, uh, 
Can you tell me, we often hear about the bed count uh, that are available on any given night in our hospitals for mental health. And I'm just wondering if private care facilities are included in that bed count. And then I have a follow-up. Mr. Gildemeister. Madam Chair, Representative Beerman, um, good question. Um, the bed count um, activity is conducted by the hospital association, and, and I don't know that we have um, direct sidelines on, uh, on what that looks like, but uh, uh, though we can request an update, of course. Uh, I think one of the challenges of the bed count, though, is that we don't know to what extent, why is the bed not available? Does that flow from patients occupying the bed or is that really related to um, hospitals lacking the staff or otherwise deciding to take beds offline? So I'm sorry if that is not a most direct answer to your question, but but perhaps our friends from the hospital association can, can give us um, additional uh, detail on that. Thank you. Beerman. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, that's that's a good answer. I wanted to just also ask, I thank you for, you know, the reviews that we hear about as far as these new spaces when we're losing beds or requests to increase them. It's really important from, to hear from the department. But, you know, you highlighted a lot of the things we're missing in this. And, it, and as far as the legislature goes, how we can get a view of the status of our mental health system statewide what else can we do to either help or support the department to gain the information we need on a more timely basis to understand the needs, to create a roadmap on where to go with uh, uh, helping the situation of mental health here in the state of Minnesota? So uh, Representative Bierman, that is a huge question. And um, I had asked Mr. Gildemeister to present those findings today just so people would know that they were there in the report. But I don't know that we can really go into all of that today. It really kind of pulls us off of our agenda. So if you could kind of hold on that question, because that you are asking a very big question, and that is exactly why I asked him to present that information. But I don't think we're in a position today to, okay. to have a full focus on that, Thanks. if that's okay. Thanks, Madam Chair. All right, Representative Ryer. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Director Gildemeister. It's good to see you. Um, my question is about a line that you mentioned about specialty hospitals and their data requirements. And that just got me wondering, to the extent that it's relevant to today's discussion, could you say a little more about that? And I would be interested in talking offline about whether this is something that can or should be addressed uh, by changing the requirements. Thank you. Mr. Gildemeister. Uh, Madam Chair, Representative Ryer. Um, yeah, I don't have the history on why specialty hospitals are exempted from annual reporting. Um, my sense is, at least to the health department, my sense is they, they might still be required to file the Medicare cost report and their, um, the, the additional burden ought to be somewhat uh, 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 limited. And there's, I think, value to the whole community to be able to access that information. Um, I may be naive representative, but but I think it's it's a fairly straight, straightforward fix if the legislature wishes to go there. And I can't imagine that it is a significant mm -hmm. burden, but but I think that would be a question for, for uh, um, our our partners in the um, at those facilities, we have found it always rel really quite easy to work with Prairie Care as part of the public interest review to obtain the additional data elements. So they do exist. Um, it's just that the requirement to submit them uh, is not there. As it concerns the the children's uh, mental health. Uh, capacity, the inpatient capacity, um, with Prairie Care playing such an important role in delivering these services, there's a huge chunk of evidence I think missing, and and that is that that is particularly um, uh, limiting uh, for for addressing some of these questions that uh, that you're contemplating. I think, and yeah. I'm happy to talk online. Thank you, Mr. Gildemeister, and I just would again say that you know. 
Mr. Gildemeister presented some of these things really to pique your interest in perhaps improving the process. I'm glad to see that members are picking up on that, but we don't have the full opportunity today to go into that, but please do follow up with him and, uh, you know, offline would be great. Uh, Representative Damon. Thank you, Madam Chair and Director Gildemeister. This was very helpful information to have the, um, an overview of the law and where we're at. Um, and as I'm thinking through this with the statutory timeline, knowing that there's a need out there, uh, maybe just more of a comment, Madam Chair, but maybe this is the time to really look deeply at this and decide whether or not we need to look at repealing the moratorium. We're hearing three bills just today that are asking for um, an exception to the moratorium. And maybe this is a time that we step back and really take a deeper dive and look. So just a comment, but again, thank you, Director Gildemeister, for the report. So thank you, Representative Damon. And so uh, interesting, you should say that, you know, I think that there's probably nobody in the legislature who is uh, familiar with the moratorium who doesn't think it needs significant work. Whether that work means just repeal it and then just everything is just uh, all driven by market and not by the public interest. Personally, I don't think that's the direction to go, but I could certainly understand that being one position. I do agree that we need to work on this, that it was, you know, as Mr. Gildemeister presented it, it came about under different circumstances. I would argue that I think the public has a deep interest in where we put health facilities and, and probably we should do a better job, not just with this bed moratorium process, but I would kind of go the other way and say that there is, we should exercise more but different control over this to make it more fair and more about serving the public. But this is a really a big discussion for another day, but it, it is, we have scratched the surface here. So really happy to have you interested in it. And I hope the conversations can continue. So thank you. And uh, Mr. Gildemeister, thank you very much. I really appreciate you doing this under adverse circumstances. And we're going to turn now to the bills before us. And I see that Representative Eklund is here. And um, so since uh, Chair Eklund is not on our committee, um, I will move House File 2812 to be laid over for possible inclusion in the Health Finance Bill. Welcome, Re Representative Eklund. Thank you, Madam Chair and, and uh, members of the committee. Uh, health, House File 2812 is important to the critical access hospitals in rural Minnesota. This bill is not a hospital expansion bill. It is a redesignation of how hospital beds are counted. The bill is permissive and allows the hospitals to make the switch if they choose to. It was brought to my attention by North Shore Health and Grand Marais. North Shore Health is seeking these exemptions for all 11 critical access hospitals with attached long-term care facilities in the state including Cook Hospital in Cook, Minnesota, which is also in my district. Uh, you have a handout in your packets which show these uh, hospitals. North Shore is a small rural remote care organization comprised of a 16-bed critical access hospital, a 37-bed skilled nursing facility, a home health agency, and an ambulance service, all located in Grand Marais. The next closest nursing home is 60 miles away in Sorbet, which is a veteran's home. The next closest hospital is over 80 miles away in Two Harbors. They are also a hospital district with a tax levy authority. Their tax levy has increased over the years with the most recent levy being $1.3 million. North Shore Health is seeking to increase their licensed critical access hospital bed capacity from 16 to 25. This would be accomplished by exempting North Shore Health from the bed moratorium as well as the Minnesota Department of Health's public interest review process. It is North Shore Health's intent to place the number of licensed nursing home beds in a layaway status and des designate those beds in space to the hospital for use as swing beds. Madam Chair and members, I have Kimber Ralstead from North Shore Health to give you a couple, a little more details on this bill. All right. Thank you, Representative Eklund. Appreciate it. Um, Ms. Ralstead, please just uh, state your name and title for the record and go ahead and give us your testimony. Um, good afternoon, Madam Chair and committee members. I'm Kimber Ralstead and I'm the administrator of North Shore Health in Grand Marais. I'm here today to express my support for House File 2812. I'd like to give a little context for this legislation. 
For the last 15 years, the nursing home that is a part of North Shore Health has lost an average of $1.5 million a year. Even with a tax levy, the ability of North Shore Health to maintain this level of loss is not sustainable. Now, as you are aware about nursing home reimbursement, it's not as simple as just increasing our charges to cover our expenses. And as a hospital attached nursing home, we are also subject to Medicare hospital cost report rules, and we have to allocate expenses based upon those guidelines. This usually results in us moving expenses from the hospital that is reimbursed at 101% of allowed costs to the nursing home where our costs exceed the limits established by the Department of Human Services. For example, in 2020, our other operating costs exceeded the operating per diem limit by $42.65 per resident day, or $530,000 just for the year. At various times over the years, due to the financial losses, it has been suggested that the nursing home be closed. This is difficult to contemplate as we are the only skilled nursing facility in Cook County. Our citizens needing this care would need to leave their home community. North Shore Health reached out to the National Rural Health Association and Stroud Water Associates, a firm with expertise in critical access hospital reimbursement for their thoughts and ideas on how to minimize our losses while maintaining our critical services. The evaluation suggested that we incorporate some of the space and operation of the nursing home to the hospital as swing beds. This recommendation was based on a previous demonstration project commissioned by the Federal Office of Rural Health Policy and the Health Resources and Services Administration. The project was known as the Frontier Health System. It was a model of integrated healthcare service delivery and reimbursement that integrates critical access hospitals with other essential services such as health care. Now, based upon that analysis, if North Shore Health transitioned basically on paper, one of our nursing home households to become a part of the hospital, our Medicare, which is federal, reimbursement would increase by approximately $800,000 a year. The impact to our residents and our employees would be minimal. Residents would stay in their current room and they would be receiving care by their current wonderful caregivers. However, to make this idea work, North Shore Health would need to increase our licensed bed capacity from 16 beds to 25 beds. This is why we're here today. North Shore Health and the 10 critical access hospitals who are licensed for less than 25 beds and who also have attached nursing homes are subject to the public interest review and the med moratorium regulations. The proposed legislation of House File 2812 would allow North Shore Health and the 10 similar hospitals the flexibility to increase bed capacity and really reallocate the use of our nursing home and hospital beds in an effort to minimize our financial losses and yet maintain this very vital service. I am asking for your support of House File 2812. Thank you for your consideration. All right, thank you, Ms. Ralstad, uh, for your testimony. Are there questions from members? All right, I'm not I, seeing- Madam, Madam Chair, I'm sorry, oh. I couldn't get my hand up yet. Sure, Representative Hewitt, please go Real ahead. Real quick, Ms., Mrs. Wall, Madam Chair, Mrs. Wallstead, um, Grand Marais is, if you can keep more people there, you would not have to send them down the road. Is that correct? Is that what I'm understanding? Um, Madam Chair. Mr. Ralston, go ahead. Thank you. Madam Chair and Representative Hood. Um, yes, what our intent is, is to really minimize our losses, maintain the care center, and um, not have to transfer people or move people out of Cook County. Madam Chair, one quick Representative question. Hewitt. Yes, and this is usually, uh, it's about a two hour ride, if I'm not mistaken, by ambulance, even bumpy ride. And also you have to uh, utilize the air medical, which is also extremely expensive for these patients too. And so it, it just seems to make sense if we can keep them in their own towns, which we know they do better. And this just seems like a logical solution for many reasons and for the survival of the hospital too. So thank you for testifying today. Thank you, Representative Hewitt. And so, Ms. Ralston, I have uh, some questions. This is, uh, um, I'm hoping that the Department of Health can give us, give us something before we have to decide on this, because I do find this still kind of confusing. What I'm understanding is that you're not expanding any bed capacity, really. As you said, it's all on paper. So uh, 
how does this then mean that you have to transfer fewer people to other hospitals as Representative Hewitt was just asking about? What am I missing here? Madam Chair, it's, um, it's actually really not. What we're looking at is maintaining the nursing home, trying to maintain the nursing home um, while maintaining our uh, minimize, actually, and I hate to say it that way, but minimize our financial losses. Many of our peers talk about maximizing reimbursement, and I'm just trying to minimize our losses. And it's being able to keep services. So um, in recognizing that the ambulance service also um, loses money, our home care also loses money, and the, amb and the care center loses money. So we're just trying to minimize our losses with this. And there was an idea that was uh, generated, and we said $800,000 was worth having a conversation about. So Ms. Ralston, then if I'm understanding you correctly, so you're not really proposing to change services. You're just proposing to change what categories you can bill for them in. Is that accurate? Madam Chair, I, it's not even how we bill it. It's really how um, the space is allocated. We're not going to change, we're attempting not to change services or reduce services. And we're attempting to, again, minimize, um, minimize those losses. And it's just literally by how we have to allocate costs. So as you guys have to deal routinely with, um, with the nursing home cost reports, we have the same issues with hospital cost reports, which cause us to have to allocate. So we're really just trying to, to focus on that. Okay, um, Representative Pryor. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And I, I did also just wanted to make sure on what we understand by reallocating costs. And again, I may have misunderstood and would appreciate the correction, but what it sounds like is you've got a part of the nursing uh, facility, the skilled nursing facility, and the rooms there, you'll say are hospital rooms? Ms. Rolstead? Um, Madam Chair and Representative Pryor, yes, that's exactly what would be done, is that we're not adding, we're not doing construction, we're not doing anything, we're just simply drawing our lines differently. Okay. Okay, and then what happens to, I'm gonna call in a second on Representative Ackland, but then what happens to people who needed the nursing home bed? Ms. Ralstead. Um, Madam Chair, those residents that needed the nursing home bed, they're still gonna have that nursing home bed. So we're really, we would de-license some of the nursing home beds, use those individuals would actually stay as hospital patients and, um, Again, it's utilizing the reimbursement methodologies that the federal government has, has given us to do. I think in some respects, what happens is that um, the critical access hospital process never took into account for facilities like ours that have all these other multiple lines of service. And so they carve those expenses out. And that's what creates the kind of that unlevel playing field a little bit for, for those of us that are doing these services. Representative Ackland. So um, thank you, Madam Chair. So just to clarify, um, the, the nursing home beds have, have been underutilized. Is that, am I correct in saying that? And because they may have been underutilized for a, a length of time, the, um, the hospital can assume, change that designation since they're hooked together to this swing bed status, uh, but you're not really, you haven't been in a crunch for nursing home beds. Is that my understanding? So that's how you can afford to rename these beds uh, to accommodate this, the, the new mental health pieces. Ms. Rolstad? Um, Madam Chair and Representative Acklin, no, actually our nursing home has been at 100% capacity. Those residents that would be in part of where the line was drawn would now instead of be considered nursing home residents, would be considered swing bed patients. Okay, other questions? All right, I don't see any. All right, well, thank you very much, Ms. Ralstead, and, and thank you, Representative Eklund. And um, so House File 2812 is laid over for possible inclusion in the health finance bill. Appreciate your information here today. 
So uh, next on our agenda is House File 3470. And that is Representative Her. And there she is. Welcome. And so since Representative Her is not a member of our committee, the chair will move that House File 3470 uh, be laid over for possible inclusion in the health finance bill. Representative Her, would you care to tell us about the bill? Thank you, uh, Chair Liebling, for having me here today. And thank you, members, uh, for hearing House File 3470, which would write a bill moratorium exception for Children's Minnesota uh, to open a new inpatient mental health unit at St. Paul Hospital. Um, at, I'm sorry, at, at St. Paul Hospital. I just don't want to be confused because they do have two locations. Members, uh, we are in the middle of an unprecedented mental health crisis among kids. Children and teens across Minnesota and the country are struggling in ways we are only now coming to understand. The greatest number of Minnesota students ever, 23%, report having long-term mental health, behavior, or emotional problems, and almost a quarter of 11th graders have considered suicide at some point in their lives. And we see disparities with this crisis, like so many others. Last year, almost half of the patients that came into Children's Minnesota's emergency department with mental health concerns were from communities of color and indigenous communities. This crisis has been exacerbated by the pandemic and will be around for years to come. We need more mental health support for our kids. We need more widely available, accessible, equitable treatment for all communities. My bill today supports Children's Minnesota in taking steps to address this crisis. House File 3470 provides Children's Minnesota with 22 additional behavioral health focused bed licenses for their new inpatient pediatric mental health unit. It does allow children to add these beds before the completion of the public interest review process by MDH. However, children has submitted its PIR application and is working closely with MDH on that process. I want to acknowledge that because the plans for this new unit came together quickly in response to this crisis, children submitted its PIR application after the August statutory deadline. With uh, such a clear need for these pediatric mental health services, I think we should feel comfortable discussing this legislation while the PIR process takes place. Um, one last thing I will mention before turning it over to my testifier is the strong support this bill and a new unit has from organizations across the state. Members will see statements of support from NAMI Minnesota, Mental Health Minnesota, and others. The need is clear, and I'm grateful to Children's Minnesota for taking steps to address this crisis by opening up this new unit. And actually, I'm going to turn this over to Dr. Chala, Chief of General Pediatrics at, at Children's Minnesota. But before doing that, I do just want to add really quick that I just got some information today that talked to the fact that there are now only two psych beds for teens available in the entire state of Minnesota. We are in a crisis right now, and our children need our support. And uh, I'm really thankful that uh, Children's at uh, Hospital stepped in to uh, put this bill forward. And so with that, uh, Madam Chair, if, you, if I could turn it over to Dr. Chala, I'd greatly appreciate that. All right. Thank you, Representative Herr. Uh, Dr. Chala, welcome to the committee. If you would just state your name and title and go ahead and give us your testimony. Thank you, Madam Chair, committee members. Um, my name is Dr. Gigi Chala, and I'm the Chief of General Pediatrics at Children's Minnesota. Thank you for having me here today, and thank you, Representative Herr, for carrying this important bill. Children's Minnesota is the largest exclusively pediatric healthcare system in the state, serving over 135,000 kids annually. Almost half of the kids that we serve in our hospitals and clinics are enrolled in Medicaid. I am here today because one in five patients we care for have a mental health need and want to share just a couple things about what we are seeing in our emergency departments. First, kids come to our emergency departments after an overdose, a suicide attempt, or other mental health concern. The volume of patients has been increasing year over year for the past five years, but last year we saw 30% more kids with mental health needs than the year prior. Suicide ideation is now one of our top five diagnoses. Secondly, the, acute, the acuity of the mental health crises that kids are experiencing is also increasing. We had to transfer over 850 patients in crisis to other facilities for inpatient psychiatric care, which was a 40% increase in just two years. At Children's Minnesota, we've been working all along to address the pediatric mental health crisis in an upstream way by integrating behavioral health into our primary care settings, strengthening our outpatient mental health clinics, co-locating mental health services within our specialty clinics, and now opening an intensive outpatient day treatment program. 
The next step needed, however, is, in our, is developing a comprehensive pediatric mental health care approach towards opening a 22-bed inpatient mental health unit by remodeling existing space in our St. Paul Hospital. Admissions to this new unit will come from many sources, directly through our emergency departments, transfers from other hospitals, and through direct admission from outpatient providers. The pediatric inpatient mental health unit anticipated to open later this year will include rooms large enough for a family member to stay with the child, outdoor therapeutic spaces, and eight of our 22 beds will be used for kids under age 12. These beds for young kids will be the first such service in the East Metro. The psychiatric unit will also ensure kids with acute mental health needs and medical conditions who currently, because of their medical care requirements, have difficulty getting a psychiatric placement will now be able to receive high quality care. We are asking for 22 additional beds because this is a new program, not originally part of our long-term planning. All of our current bed licensees are either being used or have intended uses in other medical care departments. We've been working hard to design our facilities in order to best meet the changing community needs and we believe these new beds are critical. With this new unit, Children's Minnesota will be able to increase access to desperately needed acute mental health care um, while bridging our current mental health care disparities and improving mental health outcomes. Thank you for discussing this timely legislation and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Great, thank you so much for your testimony. Please uh, don't go away. We have another testifier and then we will take questions. Uh, on my list, I have Lisa Sanford. Welcome. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Madam Chair and committee members, my name is Lisa Sanford and I'm a registered nurse at Children's Hospital St. Paul where I work in the Pediatric Intensive Care Unit. I am also a member of the Minnesota Nurses Association. We have been in the midst of a mental health crisis for several years now. It is clear that a pediatric and mental health unit is absolutely necessary and there is no one better to take on that responsibility than Children's Minnesota. We are the kid experts. However, my colleagues and I have grave concerns that current restructuring plans could not only jeopardize the success of this endeavor, but may also put these patients and others at risk. Children's plans to remove the patient, the pediatric intensive care unit from St. Paul campus, where we have saved many lives of the patients who have had a drug overdose or suicide attempt. Children will keep a fully functioning emergency department in St. Paul, which as Gigi Chawla said, will serve as the entry point to this program. The St. Paul Emergency Room has already seen an overwhelming amount of patients who are seeking mental health services. The patients who come to our emergency department needing life-saving support will require stabilization, which may include intubation or hemodynamic support. They will then have to be transported to the Pediatric Intensive Care Unit and the Minneapolis campus. And once they're medically stable, they will require transport back to the St. Paul campus to take part into this mental health program. This puts an enormous burden on already reeling families. It is not easy access to care. This is delay in care. A child can rapidly and unexpectedly deteriorate when an unknown substance in their bodies peaks. More than once, I've seen this scenario play out and without the support of an intensive care unit, outcomes would have been devastating. Any critical situation requires an abundance of staff. The model currently in place allows the ICU staff to immediately respond and assume care of a critically ill patient. The future model will require scheduling of a transport, a process that historically can take several hours and is not without risk. It is already a stress system. Transporting a critically ill child is not a last resort, is a last resort, not a plan A. While the goal is to provide support for these children prior to an attempt in taking their lives, the tragic truth is that an attempt is usually what brings many of these kids into our emergency departments and some of them are nearly successful. We must be prepared to save their lives. To my knowledge, mental health units in our area that are tied to an emergency department are also supportive by an intensive care unit. Children should not be used as a pilot program for a model without this support. Deferring to United Hospital cannot be an option. We are the kid experts. To be clear, nurses are strongly behind a mental health unit. As Dr. Chala said, it is probably one of our top health concerns, but we need to be prepared for anything. We need well-trained staff in place before it opens. 
And you must also consider lighting a beacon for these patients without every resource available to provide them with the maximum care that they need is dangerous. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Sanford. Um, so, um, well, let me just start off the questions, I guess. Dr. Chala, I um, wasn't aware that Children's was gonna close the ICU. Um, and I'd like to understand how is that related in your mind to the proposal before us? And, uh, you know, maybe you'd want to respond to some of the concerns that were raised by Ms. Sanford. And, you know, I realized that the um, kind of going back to the previous discussion with uh, Representative Damoth, this might not be within our purview because we don't have any real direct control over units that are closed. But it does seem that there is some relationship with the request that's before us. If you could comment, please. Uh, sure. I, I also have a, at our disposal, um, uh, um, Madam Chair, uh, that I have um, one of our directors of public policy, Amanda Jansen. And so I would um, respectfully request if she is able to join um, and help answer any questions that that would be um, approved. Yeah, I think that would be that would be fine. Um, Ms. Jansen, please introduce yourself if you can respond to the question. Yeah, Madam Chair, committee members, my name is Amanda Jansen. I'm Director of Public Policy at Children's Minnesota. Um, thanks for your questions, Madam Chair. So my, I will say first that these two proposals are separate. So the children's redesign plans for um, the services that we offer in Minneapolis and St. Paul are separate from us opening this new inpatient mental health unit. My understanding is also that there is a statutorily required public hearing around this redesign and Children's has already proactively reached out to MBH about that hearing and looks forward to conversations in depth about that redesign during that hearing process. Um, and I'll also say that Children's is really committed to ensuring that each campus, Minneapolis and St. Paul, will have the level of care that it needs to serve the kids in our community, no matter what kind of crisis they are when they come into our hospitals. So um, Ms. Jansen, when is that public interest hearing or the, uh, the closure hearing going to occur? Do you know? Yeah, Madam Chair, I'm not aware that there's a timeline set for that just yet. Okay, there is a statutory timeline for it and I'm not sure right now what, what exactly that is, but I know that when we passed that legislation, we did set a timeline. Okay, um, Representative Pryor. All right, thank you, Madam Chair. And again, appreciate the patience of, of the bill author and the testifiers to make sure that we understand what's before us and to go back again to physical space. So my understanding then in the hospital, the St. Paul campus, um, the plan is to, to close down the, the ICUs. And then there's another separate from that is the idea that repurposing this space to have mental health beds. And that if I can, if, and I, I'm just trying to clarify to understand, to make sure that I am understanding correctly what's before us. And that one, and the reason that this is before us now is to speed up the process of getting the mental health beds. Um, and so I guess, you know, one point that I would like clarification for is whether we approve the the exception for the moratorium um, will that have any bearing at all on um, children's um, hospitals plan about what is happening to the, cap the campus and the ICU would that have any impact at all on the timing of, of that and uh, Representative Pryor would that question be for Ms. Jansen probably I think right. so yeah <laughs> okay she, she looks like she can handle it yeah Ms. Jansen please yeah, Madam Chair, Representative Pryor, thanks for the question. Um, I wanna be clear that the space that we are using and remodeling for the mental health unit is not the space that we're closing down from the PICU. So they're, they're two totally separate pieces and we are talking about them. They're not linked together in any way. So our conversation today about asking for a bed moratorium exception is strictly about the mental opening of the mental health unit and the moving of services or consolidating those services on the Minneapolis campus is a separate redesign process that we're doing as well. Representative Pryor? 
And I just want to say thank you. Thank you for that clarification. Okay, other questions for members? All right, I guess I, I do have one other question. I understand that you did submit a, a public interest review, and, but yours was the last one in, and it was only submitted, I think, this very month. And <laughs> I noticed you're asking for 22 beds, and today is 2-22-22, so I don't know, maybe that's auspicious, I, maybe. But anyway, could you just explain why you waited so long when our statutory timeline would have had it back in August and uh, or any time, you know, obviously none of the three have made the deadline, but yours is very, very late. And so could you just explain why, why is that? Ms. Jansen, I think you'd be the one. Yeah, Madam Chair, thanks for that question. We um, fully recognize that uh, the, the mental health crisis that we are in and some of the decisions that Children's is making to try to be responsive to that crisis didn't match up with that kind of statutory timeline. So back in August, Children's was really still in the middle of planning for this unit and wanting to be thoughtful of what the unit was going to entail, what it was going to look like, where it was going to be located, that kind of thing. So a lot of those conversations were still happening in August because we were trying to respond very quickly to this mental health crisis. So we recognize that it's not an ideal timeline. We did get it in on February 1st of, so yes, earlier this month on February 1st, and have had good conversations with MDH about it and are very willing and able to spend time with them through that process, asking any follow-up questions or helping them through that process as well. Okay, thank you. Um, other questions for members? Representative Biermuck. Thank you, Madam Chair. A uh, question for uh, Dr. Chawla regarding, <clears throat> sorry about that. <clears throat> she mentioned a large volume of patients being transferred out of um, <clears throat> children's because of over uh, or under capacity. And then I presume you're getting also having the other side of that where you're often taking patients in. Could you just comment on the importance of the relationship between providers in assisting in uh, these large numbers and trying to keep people out of emergency rooms and the importance of that for the entire system, please. Dr. Chawla. Madam Chair and Representative, thank you very much for the uh, question. Yes, I do think that there are um, opportunities that, you know, for this large volume of patients, 800 or, or more each year um, that we are seeing that unfortunately need acute mental health care, that um, we work very hard to bring that to a level of need that could be managed in a way that is um, separate from an inpatient mental health unit when it is safe. We certainly see 2,000 or more kids um, and uh, roughly 800 are needing acute mental health placement. The other 1,200, we really work towards um, finding an, an outpatient program backed with their uh, primary care clinicians or a day treatment program. I think that work is some of the work that our social workers and at all health systems are doing diligently to make sure kids receive the care that they need for the, for the least amount of disruption to their day-to-day -day lives. Thank you. Thank you, all Madam right. Chair. All right, thank you. So I think we're gonna, we're gonna move on because we have a lot of test fires on our next bill, but thank you very much to uh, Representative Her and the test fires. So uh, House File 3470 is laid over for possible inclusion in the health finance bill. So moving on here, we now have Representative Hewitt's bill, House File 3281, and Representative Hewitt will be moving to that House File 3281 be laid over for possible inclusion in the health finance bill. Representative Hewitt. Madam Chair and members, thank you so much for an opportunity to present 3281. This bill provides an exception to the current hospital moratorium law that allows Fairview to go into a partnership with Arcadia Healthcare to build a 144-bed adult geriatric and mental health hospital in Ramsey County. We know that this continues to be a need. An additional patient mental health bed capacity in our state in this proposal will help meet some of this need. Fairview is looking to partner with Arcadia 
because Arcadia is a, has a different approach with mental health um, that I think we need to look at a different approach with this. We, in Minnesota, we're, we're not, we're, we're having problems and many of our patients get readmitted. Um, I heard a recent story from a, uh, a patient that uh, went off their meds, which is very common with the mental health um, population. Uh, a lot of it is affordability and we all heard that story. Um, but the person, basically, they bring them into inpatient and they discharge them within 72 hours. And that's not good mental health practices. So I think we have to look beyond our borders to see if different partnerships that some of these, uh, some of our providers can, uh, can go into. And this may be one we want to we want to look at. So today I have a testifier with us, uh, Mrs. Beth Hines from Fairview, um, followed by Dr. Woods from Arcadia. Madam Chair, if we could call them up now to uh, testify on that, it would be great. All right, thank you, Representative Hewitt. So first up is Beth Hines, welcome. Thank you, Madam Chair and committee members. Good afternoon. My name is Beth Hines and I'm the service line executive for Fairview Mental Health and Addiction Services. And I'm a clinical therapist by background. I'm also joined today by my colleague, Dr. Rich Levine, an emergency medicine psychiatrist and outpatient adult medical director for Fairview. And he's been actively involved in the care of our patients navigating emergent mental health crisis and hospitalization. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today about our plans to build a new inpatient mental health and addiction hospital in partnership with Acadia Healthcare. First and most importantly, this project will help meet an urgent need for additional psychiatric hospital beds in Minnesota. This new mental health hospital will significantly expand available inpatient mental health and addiction beds in our state. The new mental health hospital will be built to operate 144 beds for adult and geriatric patients in a specialized state-of-the-art facility designed very specifically for the needs of our psychiatric patients and the healthcare professionals who take care of them. The hospital will also operate a partial hospitalization and intensive outpatient programs for our patients. Our preferred site for the hospital is 559 Capitol Boulevard in St. Paul, which is the former Bethesda Hospital building. This hospital will serve patients not only from St. Paul and the East Metro, but we also know it will have a statewide impact. We expect the new hospital will serve patients from across Minnesota, both inside and outside of the Fairview system, without regard to patients' income or insurance status. We do appreciate that this is a new way of meeting inpatient mental health needs in our state. Plans to operate this new hospital as a standalone facility will not create any new barriers to care for patients who need inpatient services. Our process for admission will be the same as it stands today. Patients can access care at this new hospital by arriving to any of our 11 emergency departments around the state where they would be evaluated by emergency department staff who keep our patients safe while they assess them for the next best step in their care. As we do today, we will continue to work with our peer healthcare systems and emergency departments around the state to admit patients who need hospitalization, no matter where they seek care. The new hospital will operate in close alignment with our system's mental health and addiction service line. Fairview physicians will attend to the patients. Staff at the new hospital will collaborate closely with the care teams across Fairview system, from our emergency departments and empath units, to our outpatient programs and our integrated primary care and mental health teams. Together, patients will receive the highest quality care possible in a space that's designed for them with the support of a system that can assist them through that hospitalization to the next step in their care, whatever that might be. Our system is the largest provider of mental health and addiction care in Minnesota and the upper Midwest. We serve patients across the continuum of care. Our commitment to providing critical inpatient care now and long into the future is unwavering but alone inpatient mental health care is increasingly difficult to sustain for healthcare systems like ours. We must be open to new ways of meeting these urgent challenges. Our partnership with Acadia is an example of innovation required to meet this urgent community health crisis. As a regional nonprofit health system, 
we have a responsibility to find solutions. And this new hospital and our partnership with Acadia is a transformational step towards growing and protecting important inpatient mental health and addiction care long into the future. Thank you for your time. I'm pleased to be joined by Jeffrey Woods from Acadia Healthcare today. Jeffrey will share a few words on Acadia's deep expertise and their commitment to mental health and addiction as a leader in this space. All right, thank you very much, Ms. Hines. Um, I'm gonna call on Jeffrey Woods, but I, I just wanna let everybody know we have four more testifiers. We have 20 minutes and I really would like to leave some time for questions if there are any. So we're just gonna ask everyone to try to be concise in their testimony. Mr. Woods, welcome to the committee. And you are muted. You got, somebody needs to unmute you there. There we go. Oh. All right. Thank you, Beth, and thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee for the opportunity to speak with you today. My name is Dr. Jeffrey Woods. I'm the Operations Group President at Acadia Healthcare, and I'm also a doctor of nursing practice boarded in psychiatric nursing. Um, today, it's my privilege to collaborate with Fairview and the good people of Minnesota to improve access to critical mental health and addiction services at a time when they are needed more than ever. Acadia Healthcare is the leading provider of mental health services across the United States with more than 230 behavioral health and substance use disorder facilities in 40 states and Puerto Rico. We treat more than 70,000 patients a day across our continuum. We partner with many local care providers and hospital systems across the country to operate psychiatric hospitals and treatment centers that deliver specialized mental health and addiction services that uphold the highest standards of our profession. We are dedicated to providing evidence-based care in all that we do. And we are thrilled to have been chosen by Fairview to partner in building and operating a new state-of-the-art hospital uh, in St. Paul. And we are ready to deliver the same quality, compassionate care you know to expect from Fairview. Acadia is our, Acadia's strength is our specialization. We believe patients navigating mental illness and addiction, especially those requiring hospitalization, can benefit from care in an environment that is designed specifically for their needs. The new state-of-the-art facility will be purpose-built from the ground up to deliver the highest quality specialty health care possible. The new hospital's design will promote patient dignity and respect for the person. Open sight lines, wide hallways, elevated ceilings, abundant natural light, and open flexible meeting spaces will support patient safety and comfort. Specifically for Design furnishings and fixtures will support patient safety in the acute hospital environment while also providing a home-like setting and avoiding the, an institutional experience. Our hospitals are built to respect the dignity of the individual and their families. Our care model is designed to care for the patient's whole health, their whole health, mind, body, and spirit while they receive the treatment they need for their mental health and addiction needs. Patients at the new hospital will be cared for by psychiatrists, primary care physicians, and certified nurse practitioners trained to manage complex and co-occurring medical and psychiatric conditions and day-to-day -day health needs common in the mental health unit. Uh, through close integration with Fairview's broader health system, patients will have access to the expansive network of specialists and professionals they need when they need them. Most importantly, the new hospital will create more access to this kind of care for the people of Minnesota. Our new hospital will not operate an emergency department in the typical model of a medical surgical hospital. Instead, we integrate fully with our partners, emergency departments, and other referral sources to quickly admit patients to the right care setting in our hospital through a 24-7, 365-day intake process. Fairview's expansive network of emergency departments across the state will remain an important access point for patients in need of acute inpatient mental health care. And we also know that Fairview has an effective, integrated process in place to collaborate with those other area hospitals and referring programs. This new hospital will enhance that process not change it by creating more beds at any given time. We are confident in the positive impact Fairview's partnership with Acadia will have on Minnesota's mental health care system and the patients who need specialized inpatient mental health and addiction care. Thank you again for the opportunity to share more about this work with you and we look forward to answering your questions. All right, thank you, Dr. Woods. And we have Daniel Clute. welcome. And thank you, members of the Health Finance and Policy Committee, for allowing me to testify regarding HF 3281. My name is Daniel, <clears throat> Daniel Clute, and I'm an RN at St. Joe's Hospital. Uh, I worked at Bethesda Hospital for about 10 years until its closure. It's a beautiful, historic building and holds a very special place in many people's hearts, uh, as does St. Joe's Hospital, the oldest hospital in the state. 
I've dedicated my career to direct patient care and more recently mental health care. My colleagues and I are acutely aware that our mental health system needs to be reformed and that we need more mental health beds to keep up with demands. However, we have to make sure that patients are receiving quality care and that care teams have what they need to do that work safely. Given M Health Fairview's recent history of sporadic unit closures, coupled with the documented questionable history of care delivery by Acadia, the corporate health care system proposed to take over the space, I have serious concerns about this plan. My coworkers and I have gone through substantial difficult changes in the last five years. Fairview merged with Health East in 2017 and promptly began restructuring by closing the St. Joe's Maternity Unit. 2018, they announced a renegotiated deal with the University of Minnesota, U of M Physicians Group, and M Health Fairview was born. At the end of 2019, M Health Fairview announced the partial closure of Bethesda Hospital while warning that St. Joe's was also at risk of closing. Just a few months later, we entered into a global pandemic and Bethesda was converted to a standalone COVID hospital. I worked at the Bethesda site until it was transitioned to St. Joe's after about six months. This was a pivotal moment of transition for St. Joe's, converting the existing med surge and ICU units into COVID units, along with the closing of the emergency room at the end of 2020. These closures left St. Paul with a population of 300,000 people with just two adult emergency rooms. Considering Amal Fairview's closure of two hospitals, 16 clinics, six pharmacies, and the selling of their home hospice company, we hope that this could provide a financial opportunity to preserve St. Joe's mental health units, but we had no such luck. The COVID units were closed down and it was announced that mental health would wind down with a timeline of closure of June 2022. At the time, local hospitals had been getting overwhelmed even with the downturn in COVID numbers and the staffing crisis was starting to worsen. As COVID picked up again in the fall of 2021, things began to get dire once more. And now critically ill patients are still being kept in the ER for many hours, even days, due to lack of hospital beds. Mental health patients are also waiting days for a bed to open. There are currently not enough mental health beds for those who need them. Yet M Health Fairview is moving forward with the closure of their four mental health units at St. Joe's. The new partnership with the U of M saw an increase in contributions greater than $250 million between 2018 and 2019 following their new agreement. M Health Fairview's own CFO was quoted in a Strib article acknowledging that the payoff from these investments was expected to show in a more substantial way last year, but COVID changes changed our trajectory and plans there. And so St. Joe's mental health is being blamed for what is a far more complex issue. Nevertheless, we have been assured that the closure is imminent. Back to the proposed new hospital at the Bethesda site to be run by Acadia. When they say this is a $50 million investment in the community, I disagree. I call it a divestment. Overall, I see less resources going to a problem that is getting worse. And it is Acadia Health's resources which are being invested and much of it is going to construction costs. This is a great, um, this is a for-profit publicly traded company with a mixed record and I hope those on the committee have done their research on them. Because let me tell you, nurses will do their research and they will be reluctant to take jobs. You can have the nicest facility in the world, but you still need to staff it. And I know many of the people on this call are more than aware of the nurse staffing crisis in hospitals. Um, what I'm yeah. reading about Acadia is serious uh, Mr. Mr. For Clute, I have to ask you to wrap it up because we do have some other people that need to testify. Yep, absolutely. In my final closing, um, you know, what choice do we have at this point, right? M Health Fairview has already moved with a decision on closures without a substantial plan in place to ensure people receive care during the transition, which will take years. I would advocate for a recommendation to halt plans of mental health closure at St. Joe's, or at least attempt to maintain some of those units to avoid exacerbating the crisis. Um, if you choose to approve the Acadia site, it will require more oversight than JCO alone can provide. And that is what you get from a union hospital, that extra guarantee of quality care. So thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Clute. Next is Rose Roach. Welcome. Good afternoon, uh, Chair Liebley and committee members. My name is Rose Roach, and I am the Executive Director of the Minnesota Nurses Association, representing 22,000 nurses in the state of Minnesota and uh, surrounding states, 80% of all bedside nurses here in the state. As nurses confront the staffing crisis in our hospital, a public health crisis itself, nurses also continue to face the decades-long mental health crisis. As Daniel has noted, um, nurses know the dire need for mental health services, including mental health beds. Therefore, our 
our concern with this bill today isn't with the goal to provide additional services and beds. It's about who will provide them and the track record of the company M Health Fairview has chosen to partner with to operate its new facility. Recently, Fairview disclosed to m and that they have entered into a joint venture agreement with for, the for-profit Acadia Healthcare and that they intend to cede employment and operational control to Acadia. Upon researching Acadia, we became alarmed. From Medicaid fraud to employees and residents reporting fights, assaults and understaffing to artificially inflating stock prices, violations and lawsuits abound, resulting in $26 million in penalties since the year 2000 for offenses against the False Claims Act, wage and hour, workplace safety and health and labor relations laws. Acadia has described the investment environment for behavioral facilities in the U.S. as, quote, large market with attractive trends, unquote. That is the wrong focus when we're talking about services for patients suffering with mental health illnesses. Just recently, M Health Fairview opposed additional mental health beds at regions while shutting down, again, as Daniel stated, mental health services at St. Joe's. But now they want to bring in a for-profit company to run a mental health facility with no emergency department. Too many questions remain, not the least, least of which is whether or not the new facility will be allowed to provide care for Medicaid patients if a federal waiver isn't granted. We need a full vetting of this partnership that includes a public interest review and answers to lingering questions before granting M Health Fairview the green light for this project. For the safety of the patients, MA asks that the bill not move forward until such vetting has been completed. We desperately need mental health beds, but we have a responsibility to make sure those beds are safe and focused on the patient, not Wall Street investors. Thank you for my the opportunity to testify. Thank you, Ms. Roach. And, and next we have Sue Abderholden. Welcome. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Sue Abderholden, Executive Director of NAMI Minnesota, and I'm here to testify against House File 3281. Uh, NAMI and many of the other mental health organizations do want more beds, but we're opposed to this approach. First off, by M Health Fairview closing beds at the Southdale Hospital and planning the closure of St. Joe's, they're actually the ones that are adding to the current crisis and shortage of beds. The number of people that they treat at St. Joe's has been steadily decreasing and all the beds will close this summer. Second, I ask that you look in the mirror. Your head is connected to the rest of your body. When you are having an acute psychiatric episode, a mental health crisis, you deserve to be cared for in a regular hospital with access to any other health care that you need. Let's think about how people end up in the ER for a mental health crisis. Suicide attempt, overdose, cutting, intoxication, being homeless and having toes that are frostbite or having fungal infections. These all require an integrated approach to care. Let's think about the healthcare conditions that many people with serious mental illnesses have, diabetes, COPD, heart disease, liver or kidney issues. One of the units is to focus on geriatric psychiatric care. A study by Hendrick et al found that older adults with mental illnesses had quote, higher rates of emergency care, longer hospitalizations, increased frequency of falls, substance abuse and alcoholism. They went on to recommend that this population needs an integrated model of care. We also believe it's less than ideal for someone who finally gets a bed and it has to be transferred to another facility when they need other types of health care provided. It's unsettling to be tied down to a gurney and be transported. This hospital will not have an emergency room. That means they can decide which patients will be admitted. Will they take people with the most serious mental illnesses? Will they really take anyone on Medicaid? And I want to be sure that the members of the committee know that Medicaid limits payments to what is called an IMD, an Institute for Mental Disease, which is any facility over 16 beds where over half of the people are being treated for a mental illness or substance use disorder. You cannot bill Medicaid if you're on fee for service. They can bill limited days for people on Medicaid managed care, but if they exceed the limit, the state pays 100% of the capitation rate. One, all the other hospitals in Minnesota are reluctant to add beds due to the low reimbursement rates, particularly under Medicaid. We do wonder if the only way this hospital is profitable is if you limit admissions from people on Medicaid. In a letter to many of us in January of 2020, M Health Fairview, in defense of its closing, St. Joe's wrote that, quote, the hospital is operating at a significant loss of roughly $45 million a year due to reimbursement changes, and because of its age, it now requires more than $35 million in infrastructure upgrades, which is interesting since the capital cost for this new proposal is between $57 and $65 million. 
We're also concerned that they admit far less Medicaid patients that could upend the payer mix at the other hospitals, with them serving a higher percentage of Medicaid patients and thus facing greater losses. Typically, hospitals providing psychiatric services rely on providing other services to cross-subsidize mental health care. And there's a study um, from California that shows how that happened. Lastly, we too are nervous about a for-profit hospital focusing only on mental health coming into Minnesota. Um, its large size, I think, makes it difficult to actually ensure quality. I want to make it clear, we want more beds, but beds that are within a regular hospital with an emergency room. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Ms. Abderholen, and thank you. I, everybody's been rushing to get their testimony in, which I appreciate. So we do have time for question. Uh, Representative Ryer. Thank you, Madam Chair. I have multiple, so I will pick one. Uh, and I'm going to would like to start with the one that Ms. Abderholden just raised. And uh, I think this question is probably for Ms. Hines. Uh, what about um, that federal requirement? Uh, for me, one of my priorities is making sure that people who are on Medicaid, as I once was, get access to the services they need. And I saw in your um, application that you showed the case mix and that you would be reflecting that of hospitals around for mental health care. It was something like 40 some percent uh, Medicaid. Have you done the work to get that waiver so this could actually happen? Ms. Hines. Thanks, Madam Chair. So through the joint venture and the new hospital, we are operating under Fairview's agreements. So Fairview's tax exempt status aligning the charitable services in the nonprofit values. So we have agreement that we will, we will be following our Fairview financial assistant policy and the attorney general's agreement on payment and collections. So there will be no distinction or qualifications relative to Medicare and Medicaid. And I would like to, uh, to ask if we have enough time for Dr. Woods to also comment. Well, I, I don't okay. know if we do, uh, Ms. Hines. So I think we'll just stick to answering the questions that we do have here unless, uh, so Representative follow Ryer, follow up? Yes, thank you. That wasn't, uh, thank you uh, for your response. That wasn't exactly my question. My question was, um, and I'm gonna quote one of the letters that was provided as testimony for a mental health Minnesota, which I've also verified by going out to the federal site. Finally, federal law prohibits states from using Medicaid to pay for mental health care in psychiatric facilities with more than 16 beds. To open this proposed facilities and utilize Medicaid, Minnesota would need to request an IMD exclusion waiver. My question is, has that happened? Ms. Hines? Or do you want Dr. Woods to answer that? Yeah, Jeffrey, do you want to answer that? But yeah, <laughs> Dr. Woods, you um, can. Yes, thank you, uh, <clears throat> Madam Chair and uh, Representative Ryan. Minnesota has not applied for an IMD waiver. However, Minnesota, beginning in 2003, did substantially increase and modify their Medicaid products such that they now have multiple products that are within the managed Medicaid space. Um, there is latitude within the managed Medicaid space for services within behavioral health hospitals, freestanding behavioral health hospitals. And they, those services would therefore be covered um, at the contractual rates with the managed care companies. For individuals who have traditional Medicaid, um, we would not discriminate on any basis following Fairview's policy of ability to pay regardless of whether they are funded or not funded by any state or federal agency um, or private insurance. Um, so our commitment and part of our what we have built into the model for this project includes a, a substantial amount of charity care for this project, and uh, we're committed to that. All right. You know what, Representative Ryer, uh, we have uh, we have very little time left, but we do have uh, somebody from DHS on who could perhaps speak to this. Um, Mr. Burdick, would that be you? Yep, absolutely, Madam Chair. Uh, for the record, Matt Burdick with the Department of Human Services. Um, the testimony that's been provided, I think, is accurate that for folks who are on medical assistance under fee for service, those claims would be paid with 100% state dollars. And then for anyone who's on managed care for more than 15 days in the calendar month, that would also be 100% state funded. For folks with a shorter term stay or for less 15 days or less in the calendar month, 
we would be able to get federal matching funds on those capitation payments. All right, thank you so much, Mr. Burdick. So I think there, the answer is there, Representative Ryer. So we're gonna have to uh, finish up now today and appreciate all the testifiers. Very interesting, there's a lot to think about here. I do just wanna make a comment that my understanding is that this, this uh, public interest review is submitted right at the end of December. So here again, we have a very big complex proposal before us for which our, our um, information is really pretty sketchy and incomplete. And so, you know, I just, if you will forgive me for a minute for kind of lecturing everybody here today, you know, we have these deadlines for a reason and the public interest review, while our bed moratorium process is not perfect, certainly needs reform, we do have this public interest review process that is there to help legislators fully understand what we're doing. And I think the three bills that we've heard today really illustrate what a critical function this is and how much we really need that help. So it's quite distressing to me to see how late and uh, you know these things are being submitted. Um, we set those deadlines there for a reason. And just to come in and say, give us a waiver of that requirement, I think is really distressing. And I'm seeing that far too often. But um, be that as it may, we have in front of us still House File 3281, which will be laid over for possible inclusion in the health finance bill. And this will not be the end of the conversation on any of these three bills, I am sure, before we get to uh, the end of session and some decisions on this. So thank you, everybody. Thank you for your attention. Thank you to all of the testifiers. And we stand adjourned. <laughs>